significant online prominence through his activity, uh, through his active presence on social media. This content spans a wide spectrum range from pop culture commentary, allegorical narratives, and entertainment to engaging in thoughtful dialogues, advocating for various causes, and supporting philanthropic uh, efforts through crowdfunding. Through his online platform, he endeavors to promote intellectualism, ethics, enlightenment, and education. Today, we have a unique opportunity to engage with Professor Rochelle as he shares his perspective on this issue. His dedication to fostering meaningful dialogue and inspiring critical thinking aligns perfectly with the ethos of the Alpha Union, and we are eager to learn from his wisdom and experience. Without further ado, please join me in a warm and enthusiastic welcome to Professor Sankar Michel.
fishing community. And I say, well, if you don't speak a certain way, then you won't get votes. That only matters in that fishing community. If you don't live in a fishing community, you travel outside that fishing community. And someone tells you, hey, speak that way, you're not going to get a vote living in Brooklyn. <laughs> Does it feel the same way? When you no longer have to rely on that thing, when you're living in an environment that no longer calls you to have to speak that way, we are saying to our students that the reason you have to speak this way is because you have to survive a system that we created to work a certain way against you. And if only you are honest about that part. That's the part that we don't talk about. As we were having dinner earlier, I said that it's like telling your daughter to not put her drink down at the party come back and drink from it. And then you just stop right there. You don't say why. You just say, don't leave a drink, come back and drink it. And in your mind, you're giving her drinking tips. But that's not a drinking tip. Because you didn't tell them. You didn't go that step further to say they're predatory people who may do something to your drink and then do something to you as a result of terror. You see, you think you're telling your students about the grammar, you tell them you won't get a job if you speak this way, but then you don't go a step further and tell them about child discrimination. <laughs> you talk to them about both because you have never about linguistics. And so what are we talking about when we're talking about dethroning the king's English? What does that even mean in a tangible sense, dethroning the king's English? Well, first we have to start with what is the king's English? What began the King's English? At what point in time did we even subscribe to this idea of the King's English? And I'm guessing that you may say, well, it's the English of the aristocracy in the Yes. But is that really what we're talking about in America? Is that what we're talking about when there are different variations of English across the world? English across the world? Surely these people who do not speak or sound like the King in England, are not referring to the king's English, the literal king's English. They are referring to the king's English. So then, why are they talking? We are talking about a concept because, in reality, the king's English is a unicorn. English is a mythical creature. It is a Pegasus. It's a thing that exists in the imagination of very, very, very strict and narrow minded, in many instances, people who are clinging to the power and privilege attached to them being the ones who speak the way that have been made the standard of how to speak properly. I was just saying a moment ago if you speak the language, that there's stigma attached to, and someone else speaks the language to which there are privileges attached to. It's common sense as to which one you might prefer to speak. How many students come to Yale with a daughter and to these institutions who have Southern for all that? <laughs> Some reason last it. Maybe you sound like you, you have the choice. <laughs> Way of talking back home. But something happens in that homogenizing of language, culture, all of that starts to meld into this non distinct sort of generic blob of speech that is non offensive, that is indistinct. But then you have to ask yourself, well, wait a minute. When I don't sound like myself anymore, you don't sound like yourself anymore. You don't sound like yourself, and you don't, and you don't, and you don't. Who do we sound like? And why? Why do we sound that way? You see, the thing that we're not talking about when we're talking about whether or not to speak the king's English is how we all came to speak English in the first place. Unless you believe that centuries ago and years ago, everyone decided to take the same English course. <laughs> that everyone just thought that English was a great idea. <laughs> if you just skip the imperialism 
the colonialism, the weapons, the war, the thing that spreads language across the world. There's a reason that there's so many French words in English back to that. And it's not only because we just love to speak French. <laughs> it didn't happen that Language is being, as, as, as a vehicle, imperialism is the vehicle that brings language across the world, the world over. It is creating this system, this stratified system, a hierarchy, a pyramid scheme of speech. And so you ask yourself, is grammar a fact? Are, are, are grammar rules facts? Are they, is there any way to empirically prove that something is correct or incorrect way of saying tomato or tomato or tomato or beta or debata? How can you prove to me which one of those is correct? You establish what is correct by force. We talk about grammar rules and absence of ruler. We want to talk about the rules, but not the ruler. And that doesn't make any logical sense if we're going to have an honest conversation about the language. And in an honest conversation about the language, the reason I speak English, I, me, personally, speak English, and my father, and my father's father, Father's father's father. So we're forced to. This is not our original language. We were forced to. And the reason I sound like this when I speak English is that it sounds like this when I speak English to you right now. Even though this is the way I sound when I talk to my mom and then my brother back home. The reason I talk this way for the most of this speech is because I have understood something since I was a child. It's not enough to say what you have to say, but there's a certain way of saying it that allows you privileges and experience. <laughs> and you ask yourself, why would that be necessary? But then ask yourself, in an imperial situation with this colonization, what is one of the first things that the empire does, the colonizer does, to the indigenous people that they take over? And you strip someone of their language. And you strip someone of their language. So one of the main ways that you will utilize to take them out of their element. And in taking them out of their element, you will disempower them. And I'll give you an example. I, son of show, can, in a fist fight, defeat a great white shark. I can. I absolutely can. And just to be clear, the fight will take place in a parking lot. <laughs> I am going to lose the first few rounds because I will not engage. <laughs> and I'm going to wait just about the right time when the sun and the oxygen has done its thing to the great white shark. And then I'm going to walk up to the great white shark. Without an ounce of fear, I'm going to slap it in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to win that fight. So everyone who benefits me is going to lose because they didn't take into consideration one thing context. They didn't take into consideration one thing that the, what makes the shark dangerous is not. What it's made of, it's not the way that it's designed. It's that it's in an environment that plays to its strengths. When you remove it from that environment, you take away its strengths. And so, what ends up happening when you take a powerful people, a powerful people being at the cornerstone of civilization, and you remove them from their natural environment, you put them in a different environment, and you take away their ability to communicate in their languages. The same languages that the languages that they wrote their poems, their stories, their songs, their, their history. The same ones that allowed them to be able to have solidarity and strength 
You can't draw from that anymore because you've taken them out of the water and dragged them into a park. So when we're talking about the king's English, and we don't talk about the king's imperialism, the king's colonialism, the king's capitalism, militarism, the king's patriarchy, the king's homophobia, the king's religion, all of the things that comes along with the package deal of subscribing to the king's agenda. And you ask yourself, if we can prove that there's pros and cons to everything. I can argue the pros of child slavery if I wanted to. This country certainly wouldn't be, but uh, it's where it is. This building, these buildings, wouldn't be here without slavery. That applies to the buildings that the Cambridge do. Wouldn't be here quite literally without slavery. So if you can say to yourself, is it worth it? Is the, is the pro and the con worth it? If I can point to things that have been beneficial about the, the oppression, the uniformity, the fact that I'm creating order by having one standard of language that we should all subscribe to. And I've heard all the arguments. Well, what about instructions where there, there's safety issues? If you don't have one language, and you have people using slang on warning labels, you can put people in danger. So you're going to create one language that only a certain select part of the demographic can speak. So do you not care if people who speak a different language are in danger because they can't speak English? You know quite well that you're not trying to speak to everyone universally. What you're trying to do is get everyone universally to speak your language. And when they are on your own turf, you have a long term advantage. And so we're not talking about the disparity of power. And we're talking about grammar, but we're talking about power. Because if you can understand me well enough to correct me, you don't have to correct me. But if you choose to correct me, then you have to ask yourself first and foremost, what even is a correction in this context? What does that mean? Because ultimately, the so-called standard way of speaking isn't even as common as we pretend it is. How many times have you heard someone correct another person's grammar using incorrect grammar? It's to the point where we realize that all of us do not talk like newscasters. Otherwise, that would be annoying. <laughs> and think in terms of the standard way of speech, even when it comes to tone. So when you hear someone sound like this and put in this uh, speak at the end of their sentences, you think of children and women, because two demographics of people have been conditioned to believe that they have to be non threatening when they speak. And that tone at the end is called the question and intonation. And the question and intonation is used for asking questions. So, why would you use the question and intonation when you're actually making the statement? Because you want to signal a little bit of uncertainty. Because being too sure of yourself as a woman would be offensive in the patriarchy. Being too sure of yourself as a certain part of the back would be offensive. And so you just ask Todd, do you think maybe you can put out that report that I asked you about earlier next week? You were Todd's manager. Fire Todd! <laughs> I feel comfortable with your authority and you can enter into this law. But in the major realm, it's easier to have a And so we have to navigate these things when we're talking about language. What accent is appropriate? If the southern accent, which is essentially a, an evolution of the Scots Irish, if that is stigmatized as low class, it's stigmatized as 
substandard. It is stigmatized, stigmatized as even broken English. Where did you get that notion from? Because one could argue that there is certainly a correlation between the concept of proper English and white supremacy, but these people are white. So how, how do you explain white Southerners being stigmatized by an inherently white supremacist concept of correctness as it pertains to language? Because it was never, even whiteness itself as a concept, was never based on tangible facts. Race itself, like the concept of the King's English, is a concept. It is an idea, it's an abstract. It is very subjective, and it means absolutely nothing without guns. It means nothing without swords. It means nothing without cannons. If you remove the guns and the cannons and the swords, and the knives and the blades from the people who propagate the King's English, they would have nothing left but opinions. You cannot force your language onto a culture with your bare hands. You would have to have a culture change. You would have to have some sort of interaction with one another. You would have some fellowship, some trade. There's a lot more work involved in order to spread a language through the world and this is happening, where people who associate with one another, people who trade with one another, people who talk with one another, live in fellowship with one another, they trade language. They pick up words from one another. They create pigeons in order to have trade with one another. They take on how the other person speaks. But you know what's missing from that equation? The or else. There's no speak this pigeon or else. There's no, in that scenario where two fishermen from two different languages, two different cultures, have decided that they're going to piece together parts of their language in order to be able to, to, to give and take with one another equitably. It's not anywhere else. But when I am conquering, when I am the conqueror, and I'm able to tell you, speak my language or else, then we're talking about the king's language. Then we can talk about Now we can talk about the ruler. So what can we do about it? Surely we can't just literally overthrow the king's language and force people to stop speaking the king's language. Is that the objective? No. The objective isn't to make people stop using the king's language. That's not literally what you do when you overthrow a particular power. In a situation like this, you remove the or else. If you're afraid of removing the or else, how sincere is your argument? If you're afraid of removing the consequence of someone not submitting to your will, are we still talking about language? If you are saying comply or die, are we still talking about language anymore? No. If I have a higher chance of talking this way when I ask, if you still have a room available, I saw your ad, um, I'm in the area, so we're going to take a look at it. Oh, sure, it's right here on the corner of 123 Walter Street. I make it better. But if I'm less likely to get a play, oh, so um, um, I was wondering if you still got a part, but you got it in the head. I saw the head, and um, you know, I want to just come through and take a look at it. See, there's nothing grammatically wrong, so I just want to just come through and take a look at it. Grammatically, that's not an incorrect sentence. I just wanted to come through and take a look at it. I just want to come through and take a look at it. But everybody in this room knows exactly what I'm doing. There's a reason I don't have to explain it. You may not want to say, well, one sounds white, the other sounds black. <laughs> and I could do a couple other accents. I'm pretty good at them, but that would probably be racist. Right, so, <laughs> so just imagine I did a couple other accents. <laughs> Point being that if you have a higher chance to get the apartment when you sound as non-threatening and as adjacent to whiteness as possible, 
then are we still talking about language? If, if I just, when I get pulled over, have a lesser chance of getting a ticket, if I just officer, I, uh, yes, yes, sir, I do understand that. Um, I'll try to slow it down. I really appreciate that. Building up. You, you be careful. <laughs> <laughs> He said, man, you know, nah, I don't know how fast I'm going. No, are you sure with that? I'm getting at it. And I, and I know this because I have a lifetime of seeing it, experiencing it. I have a lifetime of taking advantage of it. Being a child who's cutting class with his friends, and we all get caught. And one by one, they're all asked, did you leave the classroom? And one by one, they all protest, man, I need a class, man. I hate to say, hey, I didn't tell you when I leave class. No, I am a right down. Guilty, 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 detention, 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 detention. Gets to me. Well, if I can explain a little. Um, <laughs> there was a the job. Now, I can't say that I did not step out into the hallway to see why the door was ajar. I tell you, Paul, sir, I did not leave the classroom. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying who did. I'm just saying that I did. I know you did. <laughs> that was the first one I put. <laughs> Because that standard way of speaking is associated with innocence. When you protest and, and declare your innocence, it's not enough to be innocent. You have to take on what that society associates the most with innocence. And if you ask yourself, well, then what is associated with innocence and purity? What if you look it up in the dictionary? is associated with purity, without stain, impeccable, whiteness. Is there such a thing as talking white and talking black? No. You can't talk in hereditary traits, because there's certainly not genes, there's no such thing as a racial gene. But what you can do is you can invoke generalizations and stereotypes, images that have been sold to us over the course of years and years and years, to the point where you need a hero. Is your hero going to sound like this one to be provoked? No. I'll come to it. The hero doesn't have that many voice. That's like Superman having muscles. Wow. Bro, you don't work out. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you have useless muscle? Like, why? Well, how do you do that? You can do that. How do you do that? But I digress. The fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, when you're navigating your way through these, these spaces where there is a disparity of power and you are forced to conform, and you do have to do these things or else. The only way to have an honest conversation about those things is if you were going to discuss the disparity of the power too. Do not talk about if you miss me with the conversation about the King's English being the thing that is the blue holding society together, if you don't have that, then how we speak, how we communicate, how we have a standard way of conveying thought. If everyone's not speaking the same thing, there are over 300 million people in this country. They do not all speak English. They do not all speak English. When you get your job as an attorney, reading these is not standard American English. If you get your job as a, as a medical professional, the terms that you use in the medical profession are not words that the average everyday person The idea that you need to be able to speak the things in English in order to get a job is not, it is not needed. It doesn't mean you have to speak the King's English to do the job. What they're saying is you have to speak the King's English to get the job, which means that you are going to be sitting across from someone 
who might exercise their ability and their power to discriminate against you. So don't talk to me about me getting a job by speaking this way if you're not going to talk to me about job discrimination. Because that is what we're talking about, and I'm telling you, even if you say, well, what about jobs that incorporate the way that you speak? A telemarketer, uh, an operator, someone who works for a phone company, AT&T or something like that, you know, customer service. Well, if that was the case, these companies wouldn't be sourcing out customer service to different countries where English is not When it became profitable, when it became something that was to their advantage, they no longer needed people to be the operators to speak the game's English in a standard American form. And so when they have some ethnocentric, sometimes even racist, people complaining about not being able to understand the person on the other line, they couldn't care. Because the bottom line is they're able to hire these people for less than these people at that point in the was made of. So if we're talking about the King's English, we're talking about the importance of the King's English, let's be honest about ourselves. Just say your poor imperialism. Just say, just say you have found the upside of the silver lining in colonialism. Just say it. I can't force you to do anything. No, you can't mandate mentality. You can't mandate morality. No one can make you <laughs> give someone. <laughs> can make you give someone a chance. Ultimately, they can try to inspire you. They can hope that you will follow it. But at the end of the day, it's going to be in the hands of the people because we end up in situations like, say, for example, as we talked about earlier, during slavery, not everybody was a slave. Or ever, not everyone had it. The population of people who actually were slavers versus the people who were not. At any given moment, the people who were not could have overcome the people who were, if they wanted to. At any point in time, everybody could say, all right, that's enough. Let the people go. It didn't happen that way. Because you don't, as it turns out, have to literally be a slaver in order to benefit from a slave economy. And so stopping those people from doing the things that they were doing was secondarily beneficial to you. So how does that relate to the King's English? So as it turns out, you don't have to actually speak the King's English to benefit from the concept that there is a correct standard way of speaking that reflects your demographic. You don't actually have to speak that way. And so when I am faced with yet another person who is inarticulate by their own standards, Who's telling me, boy? Yeah, that's just baby talk. You know, I'm the bro. There, I really should put him on, on, on blast. But there's a there's a artist who's keeping this. So I'm going to need to come in my comments on social media and say that the term we are shut, which he should say with now, <laughs> is yeah. But his band has a song called I'm All Yours. I'm all yours, you're all mine. Bro, do you listen to yourself? You're for your own. So when you have people who lack the self-awareness to realize you are propagating a system that will circle back around. Those chicken colonies circle back around to not only not benefit you, but it will absolutely, you are stepping on your own yard right now. So what are you banking on? What are you banking on protecting you? If you know that you are speaking against your own interests, what are you banking on protecting you? If you know that this way of speaking is associated with a specific demographic, in your society, what are you banking on protecting? And what we're talking about is in the King's English, in the belly of the King's English, the Trojan horse that it is, in its belly is racism, sexism, classism. It is a series of incidents that have helped those 
openings usher through the gates and affect your lives in ways that are seldom ever pronounced. So when we're sitting in classrooms and we're saying to these children, when they're coming into the world as idols, coming into the world ambitious, bright eyed, throwing my hands and wanting to participate in, in, in the learning. And instead, what I learned wasn't that my ideas were what mattered. It wasn't my ideas. What I thought wasn't what mattered. How I spoke wasn't even what mattered. Because you say, how I speak, and that's general. So oh, you have options. You have another option. But I didn't have any of those options. It was a very specific way we were expected to speak. Now, let me give you a little idea here. I was told that if I keep talking this way, I can get a job. And I have no place in academia and ain't no place in the classroom for nobody who talk like this. Fast forward to today. I made it all the way to Harvard University. Talking exactly like this. And some of those same teachers who I tell me to stop talking like this. I'm so proud of you, oh my goodness! I always knew! <laughs> right? The told you so was on my tip of my tongue, but sometimes it's just too good. I just wanted to savor in the irony of the moment of the people, some of the same people. There was one particular person who, my brother was one of the most intelligent people I've ever known. A very resourceful, confident guy in every other aspect, but someone told him when he was in the first grade that he was meant to roll up his hands. And he filled the second grade. Everything just went down. It's an educator told him that. Oh, you're not going to make him that's for your sister. You know, you meant to work with your hands. And he lacked confidence in so many different ways because someone got to him early and made him believe in the way that he spoke, the way that he articulated himself, was an indication of his mental capacity who he could be and what he could do. So what did I do? I watched a lot of masterpiece video on PBS. And I worked on my accents by the time I was maybe four or five years old. I was able to excite the king's English to a to level. But it was a boy. It was actually from a dad road. And all the time. And it's like, became a thing for me to imitate different accents and, and, and get them all down back. All of them except my own. Because I couldn't understand why that kid gets to say later in class and I can't say me. That kid gets to say Bubba and I can't say Bubba. Even though Bubba came from Bubba. Why Georgia gets to be the Goober state, but I can't say Gooba, even though Gooba came from Gooba. Is the other word that we get in Georgia? Do you think that's a coincidence? Absolutely not. Now, I want you to take everything that I just said, and I want you to think of one particular thing. Now, imagine the King's English being the name that you're all trying to reach for. Every single generation, you watch this vlog roll down the hill and take on a whole different incarnation from this generation before it. People are preaching about the Chinese language as though it's this pure entity, like they just pure is the thing. But in fact, from era to era, some of these people couldn't even communicate with their ancestors because the language has changed so dramatically. There's not even consideration of how technology and society will influence the way that we use the language. Earlier I said that if we were talking, if I take up my phone right now, and while I'm on the phone, it hangs up. What happened if it hangs up? Do you know what that means if it hangs up? That the call is ended. Why would I say the call hang up? 
hang away or where's the hang? It's because at one point in time, when using a telephone in order to get the call, you had to literally physically hang the receiver up on a hook. Hang up. And to this very day, we still use the term hang up, even though phones do not work that way. We still use it that way. We still allow technology and advances and advancements in our society to add new words to the way that we do. We have algo speak now. We have moderators and, and social media administrating that, that's, that's influencing the way that we talk. I say, for example, if you can't say the term suicide, murder, something because, well, the algorithm might stop you from saying it. So people started to say, I'm alive. Start using terms that mean the thing, but don't say the thing that we mean. And after a certain point in time, we incorporate that thing into the way that we speak. So what I'm saying to you is this. If it is so important to keep the King's English from being bastardized, when will we acknowledge the fact that the King's English is itself a bastard? How many languages went into the creation of the English? How many, what percentage of the English is French, Latin? How much of it is still even vocabulary wise, Germanic? How has it changed over the course of time? Over 350 languages contributing words to this language that is pure? How? Make it make sense because it is not a real thing. It is a concept. It is black. It is white. It is things that we have subscribed to as a belief and an idea that we just won't go back because there's too many benefits attached to it. It is the reason people don't want to say, people say things like, you can't choose your gender. I chose the genders that we now use. Scientists, doctors, people literally created the concept that we have now. Do you think that that concept fell off a cloud? A cloud? So you're saying that a person can't choose the thing that was chosen for them. Make it make sense. These standards go across the board. You're going to end up talking about money, you're going to end up talking about gender, you're going to end up talking about power, you're going to end up talking about disparity and deprivation. You are not going to be talking about language, you're talking about language, because language is a concept, not a fact. It is a social contract, an agreement that was made with certain factions of society that the standard that is set for affluence and ascendance should reflect them. Why else do you think they're taking the language? Who colonizes the space and lets them stay culturally intact? Where does that happen? And now here's the rub. At the end of the day, the king knows. The king knows what it is. It's the same king who was saying that these backward, spear chugging savages have no culture. Oh, but uh, there are other stuff in the museum. Uh, yeah, you people have no sense of art, but um, yeah, take that sculpture right there, that right there. Yeah, take that. You have no sense of history, but uh, listen, I'm going to take this mythology right here. I'm going to take that with you. You've just been shopping at people's cultures throughout history. And now you stand in front of me with this hodgepodge, this magpie of language, this bastard of language. You're trying to force me to call this a lie, but you agree, but guess what? Pure greed is an oxymoron. Because I had to agree to make it pure, but I had to create things from other things in order to make it that thing. It didn't come into existence by spontaneous combustion. The King's English is a part, it is, is a part of other people's language. It is a blob that rolled down the hill and sucked up in Africa, in Asia, in, in, in different parts of Europe. It, 
the rock that drew it all in and made it a part of itself. And when it got to the bottom of the hill, said, this is the standard. This is who you will be, the pieces of you that I have collected for my own benefit. That's what you are. And so to me, dethroning the king, overthrowing the king's image, is not about whether or not we can force people to stop speaking. Because that would just be doing the exact same thing that we're fighting against. We're not trying to stop people from using the King's English. We're trying to stop the King's English from using people. We're trying to create an environment where you remove the or else. And if you remove the or else, what then do you have left? You have People left. You're talking about connecting people with people, not power and oppression. You have people left. Now, everyone in this room, no matter where you're from, if they lock that door right now, and we were stuck in here, say it's a natural disaster, something happened outside, out of the zombie apocalypse. No matter where we're from, no matter how many languages we speak, no matter what it is, at some point in time, the rubber will be the road, we have to figure out how to communicate with one another, how to work with one another, how to do the things that are necessary with one another. And yes, in that instance, somebody might say, well, see, if we have one language, we can get to work better together. But if everybody is able to utilize the way that they speak, how do you know that that would be getting new ideas that we probably wouldn't come up with? Or so then trying to have a fake standard of problem, a fake standard of appropriateness, a fake standard of correctness. And I say fake because they're not really they're not really about that life. In the end, they're not really about that life. The king has no clothes. So you tell me, at the end of the day, when we're talking about the king, the queen, the court and how we should speak. What is more important to you? That you are understood, that communication is heard, that thoughts and ideas are preserved? Or are we preserving the power of the people whose only reason, whose sole reason for laughing at acts instead of ask, despite the fact that acts and ask are old words that have been around for 1,500 years. From axiom and asking. And then there's the vowel spot where many words change in the way that we pronounce them, such as task and tax. People do not apply the same standard to task and tax, but they apply to ask and ask. So we are not arguing the facts. I didn't mean to do that. But we are not arguing facts. We are arguing political, social political will. We are arguing power. We are arguing oppression. And should you not do that, that's a personal call. That's your call. That's for you to decide when someone comes to your bank and they ask you for a loan, and they tell you they're good for the money. Whether or not you can get out of that money, if they tell them that they, they got good credit. Somebody told me that if ever anybody wants you to run their credit, ain't never gonna be good. Only credit is good. I was asked, well, what do you do then? What law do you pass? How do you make this thing real? Give me something tangible. Give me a material thing like that. Some intention that you can show me as to what we can do about it. If not the king's English, then what? That's supposed to <clears throat> Just be sure. Oh my god, I can't think of anything else. It already exists. We already have diverse ways of speaking, we already have hip hop. We already have social media. We already have culture. We already have. We already have 
diverse groups of people. We already, there are people who have never been to certain places in their life, they picked up the slang from whatever media, song, they can be discovered. We already have it. We already do the thing that you're saying we can't do. We're already diverse. And guess what? We already don't all speak the King's English. Walk into the breaking world of faith. Walk into it in your classrooms. Everybody's not speaking that way. If you if you run, you know, I guess even when you're, I don't know how all of your professors, maybe some of your professors are pretty tight about stuff like that. But for the most part, no. You would ask you. Most people won't even notice it until going on what I should have put with. They don't notice that. That's technically a proper English class. Should have put it with it. Hey, now I don't know that. I, see, I don't know is not a word. But you understand what I said. I don't know. Yeah, G, J. G is not a word. So they say, but you understand that I ask you to be eating yet. So let's not play the same thing we're talking about. Words. We're not talking about words. We're not talking about language. We're not talking about the king's English. That the king doesn't even speak. What we're talking about is the king's agenda. Now, I want to be very clear. The king in this question is the wizard behind the curtain. There's no, the, the idea that it's actually Charles. <laughs> no. Here in America and elsewhere in the world, where there isn't British people, I mean, I guess there's like this old beef in the British, like it's complicated. <laughs> but no, they're not talking about talking like King Charles. It's a concept now. It's an abstract. It's something that's intangible that you can't lay a glove on and say, see, this is what I mean, but they don't sound like that. So what are we talking about? So taking back your voice, what are we talking about? Taking back your power. And we're talking about overthrowing the king's English. What we're talking about isn't so much forcing the king, or I mean, like off of his head, like the place like that. Okay, come on. <laughs> <laughs> what we're talking about is no longer weaponizing the so called standard to oppress and suppress brilliance, people's right to be, their dignity, their humanity, utilizing it in a way. Where it's no longer, we're, we're defanging the wolf that would feed on these people. And that's what we're talking about. At the end of the day, it is not about language. Linguism, linguism is not about linguistics. Any more than racism is literally about race. Because race was created as a color coded capitalist system. And the concept of race is essentially the nomination of money. And so at the end of the day, that's what we're talking about. Is we're talking about regaining your power. Not having to do this when you're a woman. Not having to do this when you're from the South. Not having to clone switch black. Caribbean, not having your friends say, whoa, wait, you're Nigerian? Three years into being friends with you because you've been cold switching so hard they never do. Unless you choose. Unless you choose. Then you have every right to choose however you want to express yourself. Overthrowing the king is giving you back your power, your right to choose. That's what we're talking about. You, Charles can talk about every woman. I don't care if Charles talks about Jamaica. We're not talking about Charles. At the end of the day, the establishment is not going to keep up with the standard that they set. They're hypocrites. Their agenda doesn't work if you don't second guess yourself. Stop second guessing yourself. 
chat the chat. However you choose, chat the chat. Do any of you know what chat the chat is? Talk the talk. Speak the speak. Lift your voice and say what you choose to say, how you choose to say it. You know what's going to happen if you do that? You will do what we did in the first place. We will create language, we will create Creole, we will create pigeons, we will figure out, we will figure it out. It will happen. Let us all again. It's removing the weapons, removing the guns, removing the swords, removing the knives, from the table, and seeing what we have now. That's the question. The question isn't in absence of the kings in this book that we have left. The question is in absence of the imperialism. In absence of the oppression, in absence of the poor health, then what would we have? That's the question. You have to decide for yourself what the answer is. I was thinking. Thank you. Questions for the guest. The chairman of the party of the road. I want to ask the guest about how this relates to decolonial anti-imperialist efforts. For example, in 1928, Mustafa Kemal, also known as Turk, the founder of the Turkish Republic, switched over his people's language from the Arabic script, which they used for centuries, to a Latin script, because he believed it would be more advantageous for them economically and politically. If this hierarchy does exist, and the king, so to speak, is enforcing his tyranny, is this a good thing for not only individuals to do, but is this good for leaders of countries, leaders of cultural groups and movements to have their people be more in conformity and more empowered within this oppressive system? Or should Adatur and Kaepernick using the Arabic script? I think that um, when we're talking about it, I think it's more in, in the context of politics, when we're talking about whether or not something's good. Um, we have to be very careful because the term good itself doesn't necessarily mean the same thing in politics that it would mean in, say, a uh, relationship or a uh, domestic situation. Like, depending on the context, good can, can vary. Um, like, say, for example, if, um, you know, the results of TNT, you know, with, with the creation of TNT, was the results good or was it was good? It didn't turn into weapons of mass destruction. And so, whether or not a country or a ruler dictates to their people that you now have to do this thing, kind of circles back to what I was saying about the king's English. When you are dictating, literally dictating to the people what they have to do, presuming you know for the greater good um, what is for them and how they should express themselves, the good determines like, how are you implementing that. Like, say, for example, there's a difference between me laying on a table and saying whoever wants to eat can come and get something to eat versus me going out into this crowd and force feeding you something you don't want. So in an environment where in a country, and I, I think to some degree that's kind of what we have here in America, is well no. Theoretically that's what we have here in America, is like we don't have an official language, but we've decided to broadly and widely utilize English and it's so widespread. We probably have Spanish channels and things like that. It's so widespread that we make it like a de facto language. But you can operate in this country and succeed in this country. Um, I know many people who don't even speak English at all, and they do just fine in this country. And to me, the goodness of doing something like that depends on what do you leave left that people don't want to do. Am I now disenfranchised because I don't speak the language that you want me? Am I now less likely to do business? Am I now less likely to be able to get certain advantages that I normally would because I don't speak that language? And if you can show that there's a tangible, like a, a, an actual decline in the liberties and the things that they have access to and the quality of life as a result of not going along with the dictates of their leader, then they'll just basically jump up the frying pan and into the front and into the flame. Now, you're not really progressive, you're essentially you're a benevolent dictator, which is a Nazi war in and of itself by forcing them to do that. And there's actually, as you mentioned, there are, there are spaces now where it's being debated in many parts of Africa, like 
they think so like English heading or French heading, and they want to return to language. But the thing is, there's so many. There's so many languages. So it's like, well, if we don't do that, then how are we going to have like uniformity or whatever? And, and, and how do we speak with one another? See, but those are choices and decisions that they're making of their own volition on how to resolve that issue. If in the event that someone else said, I'll take care of it, y'all gonna speak this right here, and that's the end of the discussion. Like parents coming and bring up fighting siblings. If that happens, we now circle back around to the same thing that we're trying to avoid. Like I said, the king's interested in the moral concept than the actual reality of a manner of speech, because in particular, the manner of speech it came about as a result of adopting many different forms of language. It's only protected by social privilege because it's associated with the Arab but other than that, it's something that ultimately is really more of an abstract than anything that's about protecting power. And that can happen in any country. Whether it's one country where there is no English, but there is a dominant language, that, that disparity of power can happen anywhere. So even when we're talking about the king's English, you can use that same concept, that same argument, in a place where there is no English. Because it's, again, more of a concept of an abstract than a tangible, single, singular entity. Does that make sense? Uh, further questions? I got <laughs> um, former speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. That was really wonderful. Um, so in, in the speech, the professor laid out uh, a model, right, where there is a stratified society. And because there is a stratified society, there are stratified dialects, right? There are dialects which are associated with prestige and dialects which are in some way stigmatized. Can there be such a thing as a series of dialects in which some are not prestigious or not stigmatized? Can there be an entirely equal set of dialects, given that likely there will not be a society that is not in some way stratified? And what do we do with that information, right? Does it only matter if that social or sorry, linguistic certification translates to social, political, economic certification. Right. Well, then those would be uh, social acts. Social acts when they are associated with um, a certain social standing um, and whether or not, I say for example, I mean, people think in terms of Jamaican Hatwa as one specific way of speaking, like the standard of speaking in Jamaica. But Jamaica has a very diverse population. It's not only um, what's on the black, and they don't all speak Jamaican Hatwa the exact same way. I mean, there's certain uh, dialects of the language that you can tell for certain people are part of the island, certain people are uh, people from, um, because there's the linguistic variation. And then there's just English, there's um, just uh, Jamaican English, and the broadcast news. Um, and when you listen to uh, you know some Jamaican athletes and, and, and uh, actors and personalities do interviews when they know that they're speaking to a non-Jamaican audience and they're using essentially the standard sort of English, all of those things exist in Jamaica. And so when we're talking about uh, a society where um, you have acolyte basic basic forms, where you're going to have what is considered to be the most educated or the most assimilated manner of speaking. Um, that middle ground where you're utilizing that along with your uh, regional dialect or your manner of speech that um, is more casual, I suppose. And then there's a basic like, form which you usually relegate to like family, friends, um, more intimate spaces that you don't speak with most people in public, um, or it's the, 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 what I consider like to be the uh, so-called pillars form of the dialect. The thing that's the furthest removed from the uh, lexifier, the, the, the base language that you can up to creating it. I don't think that it's a question of trying to remove the, well, I don't think that it's a question of trying to remove like, the, the social status, like, like that's not the thing, like seeking equity. I think that it's seeking humanity and dignity, because if in the event that there's only a certain amount of people who speak a certain dialect in a, in a region, um, is it reasonable that everybody, I say for public documents, that everyone's language should be represented in public documents equally if there's only a certain amount of people who speak that language in that, in that, in that area? Mm, probably would be practical. So, what we're really talking about isn't so much a, a place where the people are given an equal footing in every instance 
where they, and that, that you can be what they see. Like for, for me personally, I'm not seeking for Dola to be uh, to have equal foot, uh, footing to standardize English. Like that's not my, my I'm not looking for newscasters to so start talking like this on the news when they get up. That's talking to people, you know, like you don't you ain't talking like this, that's I'm good. Like that, I'm it's a little weird when people do try to do it. So I'm like, no, you're good. You're good. Uh, so I'm not looking for like 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 equal presence, equal representation across the board. What I want is for in a society where these social acts are backed up by uh, where the, 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 the caste system is, is backed up by like force and uh, coercion and consequences. Like if you remove those things, I think that to me is enough for people to be able to do it organically. Like say for example, if, 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 if you come to class and First day you have a, 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 a way of speaking if you speak hybrid language, you know, and hybrid language, and, and, and people don't understand as much what you're saying if you're in Idaho, and they've never heard it before. So they, it takes an adjustment for them to figure out what it. That's a great point. So that's a that's a great opportunity. That's a great opportunity for people to hear stuff that they've never heard before, for you to exchange languages, exchange words, um, and to be able to communicate with one another. But if I hear that matter of speak and associate it with low class and start treating you that way, even if I think that, but don't treat you that way, that's one thing. But when I start treating you that way, that's what makes the social life social. It's not that people think of them a certain way, it's that you're relegated to a certain, you know, certain spaces, you're relegated to certain opportunities or the lack thereof. So what we need to do first and foremost is start thinking in terms of Instead of focusing again, instead of focusing on the language, focus on the people first. So if I look, look at you on the people first and say you sound like you're from the, the, the backwoods of West Virginia, you know, and I focus on you first before I focus on the way that you speak. And I, what are your needs? What are you asking me for? What is it that you see? What is the education that you're that you're looking for? Can I provide? That to you. If I do that first, the way you sound or your accent or your dialect will be secondary. We won't find ourselves in a conversation about that because remember, going back to what I said, is when we're talking about language, we're talking about discovery of power, we're talking about all of these systems of oppression that go into that. So if we just skip over the, 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 you know, the fake part as the decoy, the silver, the shiny you know, object that you're trying to get your focus on, and go straight to the person. And deal with how, what would it take for you to feel that you're being dealt with effectively? What does that mean for you? And are you being represented in a way that is dignified? If I answer that question, then the other question that you're asking is answered by default to the results of uh, me treating you like a human being, a full on human being. Does that make sense? And for the final question. The former floor leader of the right. Oh. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I have a question for the professor regarding um, early language education, specifically for students with um, for whom English is their second language. Yes. Right? I'm sure there are people who come into your class who have not heard a word of Gullah in their life, and you have to direct them and say. This isn't quite right. Like, let me help you get to where you're speaking, to where a, a Gullah speaker can understand you. Um, how do you view language pedagogy uh, in a way that isn't necessarily um, punitive, but is informative and helps someone really develop that skill? I'm interested to see this as a constructive vision for language pedagogy. Okay, cool. There's two things that you said um, in the same sentence, and, I, and, and it's very interesting. Um, she was saying, like, if someone says in a Google course he does something, and I say, well, this isn't quite right, let me show you how to do this in a way that, that uh, a fellow speaker would understand. You can actually say the second part without the first part. Like, I can say, Oh, when I you show me the thing, like you, you are communicating the thing in Gullah, I can say, oh, let me show you this, how to do this in a way that a Gullah speaker, most Gullah speakers, 
would understand what you just said. See, in this instance, I'm giving you the information that you need, but I'm also speaking life into you, giving you encouragement without you having to overcome me having done this when you try to answer the question. So I didn't slap you down with, like, you know you're wrong. Let me show you the right way. It's like, no, just let me show you a way that would help you achieve the goal you were trying to achieve. You see what I'm saying? And so it's like with my dad, when I was in school, uh, early on, I was having a hard time with history class because I had never learned all that stuff over the years. And I'm like, that am I supposed to like believe this? I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Like, if they ask me this question, I'm going to give them the right answer. But the right answer is the wrong answer. But they don't want that answer. And my dad told me, he said, well, listen, son, you don't have to believe the answer they want you to give them. You just need to know the answer they want you to give them. And give it to them. And that's how we navigate through these spaces. Is I knew I wasn't going to pass that class if I didn't tell them, you know, uh, George Washington never told a lie that he You know, if I didn't go along with a lot of things, I knew that I wasn't going to get the grade that I needed to get to get out of the class. I had a, a history teacher tell me that um, he, he said to me the most uh, slavery were benevolent because he was like, you would be proud of a Jew because they're people of property. And you don't see people just like, you know, hitting their tractor or their goat. You know, like, did you just get poor? Like, you know, it's like a cow, tractor, and goat. You know, and I know it wasn't right. But I, I learned what they wanted of me, and I learned to give it to them on paper without allowing it into my mind. So in my classroom, what I try to do is not that. I try to create an environment where you can feel fully represented and be yourself and know that it's a space where it's open to learning. But the, the concept of, I really want to like, Go off on a tangent, but I'm not going to do it. But I really want to. Um, especially institutions like yours and mine, in, in, in the Ivies, and these ones that have become like the pillars of education, and people look to us as the beacons of, of what education is supposed to be the standard. And there are lots of things that become so standard that it doesn't leave as much room for the human condition in the learning process. And so, one of the things about teaching Gullah is the context of how Gullah came to be. See, I can't get around the fact that the Gullah language, in part, was created in the conditions of slavery. That's just not. I can't change the fact that, along with the evolution of Gullah, and how it was not only created in the condition that it was created as a mostly oral language, well, it's a mostly oral language because the people who created the language, forced to create the language, were, by the law, illiterate in the new language. You forced them to not be openly literate or else. There's that or else again. So imagine, years later, the same people who said that you have to remain illiterate or else are now saying you have to become literate in the way that I say so or else. That's not a person who's genuinely interested in being literate or illiterate. That's a person who's genuinely interested in owning and controlling and some capacity. And language is the means of doing that. So I try to not recreate those systems in my class that with the baby of my existence to the student. You understand? So I will show you what will help you communicate. I will show you, and even, even tell you, one of the big things is orthography, when we start talking about spelling. There's no standardized spelling. And I will tell people in advance, if you do know if you spell this this way, the average girl is going to be developed, right? The word bite, B-I-T-E, in Gullet will be spelled B-A-I-T. And a lot of people would be like, what is he talking about? And what's happening here is if you, anyone's not, okay, I'm going to so I'm sorry, I'm going to go my third out. But if you look at an international um, phonetic algorithm, 
Uh, now that in the symbols that inform the, the spelling, uh, the AI is where you get the I sound from. And so it will be fine if you get B-A-I-T, we know that it's at the end of seven years of age. And so you are clearly doing something in a classroom that is, to some degree, very esoteric concept and project that is trying to push the language forward. And a part of the reason that I'm doing that is because I want to decolonize the language to the best of my ability to give these people a unique way of speaking that reflects who they are, as opposed to constantly having to meet halfway the people who force you to speak the language in the first place. And we're going to let Professor Richard will be giving closing remarks after the student speeches. For now, he is very much a In closing, what I think about, um, can you hear me here? In closing, uh, what I'd like to say is first and foremost, I am thankful to be, uh, for being here for the program. I will probably be incorporating SEN. I'll give credit in my discussions. Um, but I want to say that um, I think the ideas expressed here around language and um, the, the king's language and the politics of it. Uh, the position that it holds in, in our society, I think that there's a lot more in common on both sides of these arguments than what people might expect. Um, even in the speech that we just heard, essentially, not to frame anyone else's argument, but we're essentially saying that English is indeed incorporating um, other languages and growing and expanding, and that that what we know is the King's English, as you pointed out with Daniel Webster, has already been essentially overthrown. Which is why you, if you get on social media, you hear many British people saying America's ruined English. <laughs> you know, you hear that already. So we're all the argument that, that it may change or it may be overthrown, that time has passed. So what we're dealing with now essentially is the attitude that is left behind. Social perception of that. And I'm glad to have listened to what you were saying about um, poetry and the quality of poetry. And one of uh, the types of poets that really struck me, um, I had a, a, an experience where I was able to experience Rumi at an early age. And I was so mind blown by the imagery and how vivid the descriptions and everything were, but it was translated into English. Um, but that also made me think about. Um, some of the writings of Zori Gale and Hurston. Um, and the Jamaican Afro advocate for food, and some of the poetry that she would write, and some of it in certain instances where she compared um, the way that her mother made her feel to like the king of a donkey, or that it made her heart go And in that moment, when she says that it makes her heart go that may not be a very an English term, a word that is highly sort of romantic and flowery and very specific, but in words and languages where onomatopoeia and descriptions and things like that are used to convey sound, I knew instantly what that book would be. So when we're talking about language and what it means in these very sort of finite terms, we're really talking about perspectives and what these things mean to us when we're sharing our perspectives um, and how the language impacts us. But the one thing that I think we can agree on, as you were saying with Yiddish, um, the, and I'm glad you said that because what's happening here is it's not so much that the language is dying, it's that the people are dying. The communities are going away and languages do not exist in thin air. They're housed in bodies and spoken out of mouths, where those mouths closed for the final time, even if you did have them in books or in posters or in works of art in a museum somewhere, that's not really the language still living. It's still existing in some form, but it's not still living. So in terms of the case of English, as we talk about the concept of overthrowing it, it's already been done in its own way. And it's already turned into this concept that is no longer a living, breathing entity in its most traditional sense. Because as, as it turns out, 
the traditional sense of purity was with all the mind. So what we're talking about is people first. So that's what I'm encouraging you to do when we talk about people first. If you're trying to preserve the language, that does not mean so much the words, it does not mean so much the stories of which one is better than the other because we can find great poets in every other language that we were saying. We can find some pretty terrible poets. Huh. And, and, and the point that you make about um, the cultural preservation, that you were saying that what about preserving the culture and preserving the language? Well, not every culture, as you say, needs to be wholly preserved. And so letting things go in a natural way is a necessary, a necessary means of It's letting things grow organically. So we're thinking about how to preserve a language and how to open spaces for a language to exist and where a language should be present. First and foremost, ask yourself, what are you doing for the speakers of that language to feel comfortable speaking that language in those spaces? If you open up the door and say that from now on, everyone is allowed to speak a certain way in this space, but the environment is not welcome to the people who you expect to speak that way, that language will not be spoken in that space. So when talking about the language, don't forget to think about the people who speak the language. And that is the perhaps of what you're motion. Second. Second. I am so nice. <laughs> yes. Perhaps another motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think we thank the guests. Second. 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 Second